chapter 2, verse 13, response to God's standard. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Definition here of declared righteous. Justified in Revised Standard Version, King James Version, NASB. On the judgment day, God will pronounce obedient people legally not guilty of the charges against them and in the right before him. Righteousness or justification, the same word in Greek, is essentially a legal concept. So righteousness uh, is the declaration that I have fully, uh, I have fulfilled all of the obligations of the law, both actively and passively. And because I have done that, I, I've been justified. I've been declared righteous. I will not be condemned. And I will receive all of the benefits of the law based on my righteousness, namely eternal life. Knowing the law but not obeying it is simply not enough. And the Bible, the Bible's not a good luck charm. The Bible's not some kind of religious key that's going to unlock eternity for us. It's not it. The Bible, it's not even a book. The Bible is a miracle. And the miracle of the Bible isn't found in its closed pages. The miracle of the Bible is found in its work in our heart of the Holy Spirit. Uses God's Word, uses His own book. The Holy Spirit wrote a book. That's the Bible. The Holy Spirit uses the Bible to, to, to grow our heart and to, and to change our heart and, and create, create godless, godliness in us and, and make us more like, like Jesus. The power of the Bible it comes from you and I open it up, reading it, uh, digesting it, uh, listening to it, engaging with the Word, and letting it transform us, letting us, let us surrender to it so the Holy Spirit works on the inside out. That's the power of the Bible. Knowing it isn't enough. Uh, just ha possessing a Bible isn't enough. We've got to do something about it. We've got to engage the Bible in a way that, that, that drives us into more of a personal engagement with Jesus. If we're using the Bible in a way that doesn't draw us into personal engagement with Jesus, then we're using it incorrectly. The Bible is a tool that you and I use to, to come into personal engagement with, with Jesus. God requires obedience. The text says, it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. It's not just enough having a Bible. It's just, not just enough knowing what the Bible says. You and I have to act on it. And, and how do we act on it? We act on it by, by placing our faith in Jesus and using the Bible to come closer in fellowship, closer in relationship with, with God. Chapter 2, verse 14, capacity for good. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by uh, nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Here's a definition of that. That's kind of wordy. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's interesting. How do we figure this out? So when Gentiles who do not have the law, let's look at what he means by this. Paul is giving an example of people who do what the law says, even though they have not been brought up with it as Jews. At least two inter interpretations have been offered for these verses. First of all, Gentile pagans sometimes do what God's law requires in obedience to an innate or learned moral law inside of them. Talking about law of conscience. On judgment day, their consciences will witness to both the good and the bad they have done according to the law they know. Of course, even the best people will turn out to fall short of the law within them, but they will be judged by that standard. Now, here's the second interpretation. Uh, Gentile Christian converts now have God's law on their hearts, although they do not have the law by upbringing. On judgment day, their consciences will witness that, they, that although they have fallen short in every area, their deeds have begun to show the fruit of their faith in Christ. God will justify them because of their faith in Jesus, demonstrated by deeds done by his, by his strength for his glory. People have a law of conscience. It's like you and I have this, have this recorder strapped around our necks and recording every single thing that we do and that recorder is called conscience. And sometimes you and I follow conscience and sometimes you and I break conscience and the recorder hanging around our neck, it records all that stuff. And at the end of our day, when we stand before judgment with God, God takes that recorder around our neck and says, okay, this recorder is based on, on your conscience. You have the law of conscience and I'm going to judge you according to that. Other people, like the Jewish people and like Christians, we have the Bible and we know the Bible. And so we've got a recorder strapped around our neck as well. It's called, called, you know, basically it's the Bible. And at the end of our days, God is going to take that recorder that was strapped around our neck and see what we have done based on the truth that, that you and I have known. Unfortunately, no one is capable of perfect goodness. You and I need to lean into grace. Our own consciences are going to declare to God that we have failed. And our own knowledge of the Bible is going to declare to God that we have failed. The only thing that's going to work is our faith in Jesus. The only thing that's going to allow us to escape condemnation. 
Chapter 2, verse 15, let's talk about this a little more, the law of conscience. Since they show that the requirements for the law are written on their hearts, their conscience is also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Our moral sensitivity matches what God's law required. God gave us conscience. Yet when we do something wrong, we get this little, this little kind of ping, red flag in our head, you know, I think this is wrong. Where does that come from? God gave us our conscience, and, and the God-given conscience that we have is not going to conflict with the God-given word that we have. The Holy Spirit works through both. The Holy Spirit works through conscience and, and convicting us, and the Holy Spirit wrote a book. So you and I have God's specific revelation. Our moral sensitivity matches what the law requires. Our moral sensitivity makes us aware of the wrong that we're doing. We get red flags saying, uh-oh, I've done something wrong. It says the conscience also bearing witness. The Holy Spirit is using our conscience. To, to convict us. Our moral sensitivity functions as the law for us, who, for those who don't have the Bible, for those who weren't brought up uh, Jewish and they don't have the Old Covenant. So their, their thought now accusing, even condemning them, the Holy Spirit is going to use our conscience and the Holy Spirit is using our conscience. Even where we don't have a Bible, the Holy Spirit has given us sort of a Bible called, called our moral conscience and the Holy Spirit is going to use that. 2 verse 16, judgment through Christ. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's and women's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. God's judgment will be based on his perfect knowledge. No explanation is going to be needed. You know, some people might think that I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to say, well, I'm not as bad as the next guy. Or I say, yeah, I, I did that white lie, but this is why. No explanation is is going to be needed because God has a perfect knowledge of everything that happened. The text says the day when God will judge the secret thoughts of all. God knows our most secret thoughts. We're not hiding anything. There is going to be no explanation needed because he, he just knows. He knows what the truth is. God's judgment will be conducted through Christ's mediation, uh, where righteousness will be declared instead of judgment. So it says, through Christ, through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So as God comes and he sits, the Father sits in judgment, the Son will be there saying, no, that one, that's one of mine. No, that's one of mine. No, that's one of mine. That person's covered by the blood. That person has faith in me yeah, through mediation. So, so the only way that we escape this, this judgment that sets us up for condemnation is by Jesus mediating for us and saying, no, he's one of mine. She's one of mine. We have got to place our faith in Jesus. We've got to press into that faith in Jesus and increase our fellowship with God because God knows. No explanation is needed. Oh, but God, I've been a Christian all my life. I believe in Jesus. Yeah, okay, I go to the bar and I get drunk occasionally. Yeah, okay, I smoke up occasionally. Yeah, okay, I do some stuff with women I shouldn't do. Yeah, okay, I do all this stuff, but I believe in you and I forget it. We have got to press into that relationship. No explanation is going to be needed on Judgment Day. You and I need to remember. We need to walk in the fear of the Lord. Remember that, that He is the judge. And the only way we escape, con escape condemnation is through relationship, placing our faith in Jesus and growing that fellowship, loving God and loving others as ourself. Let's look at the summary for this, this passage. We are all equally sinful, whether we consider ourselves Christians or not. God's judgment is perfect, ours is not. When we judge the sins of others, our judgments are immediately appealed to the highest court and judged. Unfortunately, our judgment indicates that we recognize the signs of sin because we are sinners. When we choose to judge, we lose the benefit that comes with repentance. Instead of judging, we need to be reflective of our own sin and repent. A judgmental attitude is difficult to deal with because it typically indicates self-righteousness. If we think we are more good than others, if we think we're gooder, more good than others we see around us, we will be surprised when we receive the judgment we feel they deserve. God reflects self-declared, sorry, God rejects self-declared spirituality. Salvation comes exclusively through Jesus and not through merit, heritage, lineage, length of time attending a church, etc. Because judgment is unavoidable, we should be living with Jesus' return in mind rather than being preoccupied with the sin that we see in others. People will be judged because of sin. Failing to live up to God's standards, whether we are a Jew uh, who has been given God's written law or a Gentile who has been given the law of conscience, God will judge us on what we have done with the truth he has given us. Unfortunately, no one is capable of being good all the time. 
Thankfully, God's judgment is conducted through Christ's mediation so that all of us who have faith in Jesus will, uh, will be spared God's wrath and punishment. I'm going to encourage you to leave a comment, please. Uh, answer one of these questions. What did I hear? Le leaping out of the text, what did I hear? What does it mean? What do I think God's word actually means? And what do I need to do about it? Can I just encourage you to leave a comment below? God bless you. See you next time.